Hello, welcome back to Agate Video Podcast. This is a space where we host conversations with different architects, designers, and industry thought leaders to help educate you and your work. My name is Joe Agati, and I'm the COO and Director of Design here at Agati Furniture. On this episode today, we have Chris Knoll, a founding partner of Nolan Tam Architecture, a firm engaged in projects with active community involvement and environmentally responsible design. Welcome on the podcast today, Chris. It's great to have you here. Great to be here, Joe. How are things going out there? Oh, it's great. We're muddling through, uh, we're muddling through COVID times, but uh, you know there's still a lot of work to be done, and we're we're very busy. So things are going things are going great as long as it's not burning and <laughs> whatever, <laughs> one natural disaster after another. So yeah, right. So you guys are based in Berkeley, correct? <laughs> yes, we are. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, although everybody's working from home these days, so pretty yeah. much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, is the office fairly sp far spread out for where people live, or do people tend to kind of live closer to the office? Most of our people live in the East Bay, uh, the okay. San Francisco East Bay. So, yeah. And so it, people live pretty close to home. And we're all we're all looking forward to getting back in the office. We're a very tight knit group. Um, we have in the past, you know, our sort of culture brings us together a lot. Mm. And so um, even though we're sort of getting the work done, we're missing each other's presence. And so we find we find various excuses to get together from time to time and in a, in a sort of a safe way to do that. But uh, we are really looking forward to getting back in person and sort of being there with each other. Yeah, I can I can understand and definitely relate to that. Um, well, I want to start us off, um, and usually we start with, you know, give us a little background of kind of how you got here to where you are today. Oh, well, you know, architecture, how did I stumble into architecture? I think that was, uh, that happened, that happened in college. I hadn't, I didn't see it coming. You know, I had a million different things that I was interested in doing in college, kind of the wonders of the American sort of, uh, higher education system. It's, you don't have to specialize too early. So I came in wanting to do about six different things and I stumbled over an architecture class and it just the light bulb went off and said, yep, this is it. This combines all the different things that I'm interested in. And um, I quickly then focused in on getting an undergraduate architecture degree and then went on to graduate school uh, and um, started working in architecture um, professionally in 1981 and haven't looked back since. So it's been 30 30 years plus <laughs> in this profession, and I never tire of it. There's always something new and interesting to do, um, and that is kind of the wonders of, of being an architect is that uh, I rarely do the same thing uh, in the same way twice. So how did you decide to start focusing in or start getting work with uh, like the library community? Well, again, another sort of uh, stumbling into it, I was working at another firm and we were doing the Redwood City Library uh, south of San Francisco. And um, I was on the project. And so I started in as a, as a sort of project architect and then, um, you know, became the project manager toward the end of the job and um, thought, wow, you know, libraries are really cool. And, uh, and I, I really enjoyed it a lot. And so, um, you know, years later, when I started my own firm, uh, one of the very first projects that uh, my partner Janet and I chased was a library in Oakland, the Rockridge Library. And even though we, we had just started the firm, we didn't even have an office yet. You know, we didn't have even a logo. <laughs> we we're sort of still shooting from the hip. We came this close to actually getting that job somehow. I don't know, force of personality or something. And, you know, the people who did get it were a far more experienced firm. Uh, than us. And it made total sense that they would get it rather than us. But, you know, ever since then, we said, yeah, we almost got that one. And then one of our next first jobs was um, with UC Berkeley. And um, it was a library project. It was uh, the Art History Slide Library. It's a little, you know, a couple of rooms and no library at Berkeley. And, um, and then one thing led to another. And we just said, you know, you know, among other things, I mean, we, we've done a lot of things, but libraries were something that were really special to us that we started out doing, and I started specializing in libraries um, at that point, and uh, and haven't looked back. I've immersed myself in everything library ever since uh, the beginning of uh, this part of my career. Interesting. So, uh, just going back to what you said earlier, so libraries are really cool. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I say that really honestly. I, it's heartfelt. Honest. I was just curious. Well, what what makes libraries really cool to you? 
Uh, there's so many different ways you could define that, I think. Um, they are um, kind of ever-changing institution. You know, they are, I mean, they're cool because they're kind of at the center of our sort of democracy in, in a certain sense. So they're really important. Everybody is welcome, no matter what class, race, you know, whatever you are. You're welcome in the library, in the public library. Um, when you get there, you know, there you have books to read, you have information to get, you're being helped by, by librarians, you're being taught critical thinking, you're being shown your, you know, privacy, you know, your, you know, your, your, you know, there's all of these really good qualities uh, that are being um, sort of provided for you at this institution. And it's a, that's a pretty improbable institution. If you think about inventing a library today and you went to somebody and said, well, hey, I'd like to create this thing where, you know, we're going to spend a lot of government money and we're going to let people take books out for free and we're giving them a nice, quiet, warm place to sit and, and just enjoy things. I mean, it'd be pretty hard to justify that. But somehow we've ended up with a library as this really cool institution where, you know, mm -hmm. we all are welcome and mm -hmm. go and it provides us with this really valuable stuff. And, you know, what's particularly cool about it is that it's, constantly changing um mm -hmm. it is it never it's never the same thing twice you know it's, i mean that's sort of in general a little bit about architecture but in libraries it's sort of you know double down that way where you know it is constantly um sort of evolving librarians are sort of do the most amazing things i and i sort of have this amazing respect for librarians um they are adapting to new needs and new technologies all the time and um, they're doing it with enthusiasm and energy, and um, it is, you know, just kind of, I, I stand in awe of their professional um, dedication and their creativity and their ability to sort of make um, an amazing experience for the community with almost no money. And that's <laughs> the thing. Most people say, well, I can give you an amazing experience. You give me a lot of money, I can give you amazing. Yeah. Librarians do it on a shoestring again and again and again. Um, and, you know, as I mean, I think that they're mistreated because of that, because people just assume they're going to do great things. If, even if you cut their funding, mm -hmm. the problem is that they, they, they do, <laughs> they show up and they do great things, but they deserve, they deserve as much as we can possibly allocate to them out of our resources. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I never amazes, never ceases to amaze me how resourceful librarians are, you know, I mean, I guess it comes with the, you know, the background of, you know, being able to kind of discern, find, deliver information to people, but it seems like they're always able to leverage that into kind of everything they do um, to kind of make the library successful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's more than information. It's more than books for sure. You know, mm -hmm. we kind of know that, you know, we're seeing fewer books uh, on shelves in libraries mm -hmm. um, and having kind of, you know, a different type type of way we collection and collection management of, you know, fewer books, but wider resources and being able to act, get people access to whatever it is they need and information, you know, that's always been part of it, but there's all kinds of other things that libraries are doing. Um, you know, they're always looking for ways of being relevant to the communities that they're serving. Now, and, um, you know, that might be, you know, lending out tools, um, providing spaces for people to use, you know, either individually, you know, it's individuals come in and use spaces in the library for their sort of their starting a business or they need a quiet place to work, write their novel, you know, or their screenplay or, you mm -hmm. know, my brother-in-law did that. You know, these are the kind of things that, you know, libraries can provide. Uh, and then, and then along with, that come the programs that get layered over the spaces that people have. So, you know, you have a space, but what do you do in the space? And there's so many different things that, that can be done within the spaces, seminars or book readings or um, lectures, or whether it's by the library or whether it's by um, partners or other outside groups or actual individuals themselves saying, I'd like a space in the library to have this, um, this group meeting or this group presentation to it. To, and so, you know, the libraries are, and sort of in many ways, um, kind of this platform we see it upon which the community's expectations can be delivered. And, um, and so we're always sort of, you know, kind of trying to figure out, well, what are those things that the community wants? They are often have a hard time articulating what their needs are. Um, I mean, in as much as how it relates to the library. I mean, they know what their needs are. You know, I need a job. I need better. I need, you know, I need to learn something. I need to train. I need to, you know, some aspiration that people have, then we have to figure out how, how can the library then help 
with that in that way. And, you know, whether it's space or a program or connectivity or, you know, or partnering or finding ways of, you know, making things happen. That's what libraries can do. So it's so much more than sort of even just information, which is so critical anyway, but there's, there's so many different multifarious ways that libraries work. Yeah. And earlier you talked about, you know, they're con, you know, constantly changing. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, when you think of a building, building's fairly permanent. Um, so as an architect and you're thinking about going and designing a library and keeping that in mind that, yeah, they are, they're evolving. And it seems like they're, you know, compared to like maybe 120 years ago, they're evolving faster and changing probably more frequently. So how do you take that into consideration when you're thinking and working on a new project, whether that's a renovation or, or you know, build from the ground up? Mm -hmm. Well, it costs so much to build space in, in California. It's, it's incredibly expensive out here, but I know it's expensive across the country. And so anytime you build a space, um, you got to make sure it's worth doing and, um, and you want to get the most out of it. Um, and so we're really conscious about creating flexibility into our spaces because um, once you build it, it's it's there, as you say, and it, it's not going to change without investing more money into it. Uh, and so how can you create spaces that will do the things that we know we want to do now and will do the things that we envision right now for the future and create that flexibility and adaptability and also to provide, you know, space to do things that we haven't thought of yet. And, you know, things that we, you know, that we don't even know are coming down the road that, that might need to be accommodated in the library. So flexibility is key. And how you exactly do that is, um, you know, is a tricky business. You have to sort of, you want things to be somewhat specific because it needs to sort of relate. You can't just be a generic, you know, blank box, you know, a series of boxes, you know, that anything can happen because, then that means that nothing is being done very specifically. So you want to sort of have a specificity to things that you're having, like reading spaces or, you know, collections or specific rooms, uh, meeting rooms or um, maker spaces and things like that, that have some particular, you know, functionality to them that you really build in. So it does it well, and it does it kind of with, with sort of energy and, and interest in and makes, making interesting spaces. But then you need to sort of allow for being able to sort of knock walls out or change, you know, where the wiring is, or the lighting or the ventilation um, and, um, you know, adding glass walls in the future or removing glass walls that you have now, you know, all kinds of things like that, that will allow you to kind of say, well, I don't know what's coming down the road, but, you know, if I, you know, I've designed this thing so that if I need a bigger space, I can take this, you know, I can take out a partition here and it's not going to cost very much to do that. Or I have a folding partition. I can just open it up and I can close it. You know? And so it's about spaces and having the right sort of number and size of spaces and, and configuration. It's about adjacencies, you know, and, and all this while you have to sort of accommodate kind of the basic things like, um, mm -hmm. Uh, acoustics, you know, you can't just mm -hmm. have one big space. Sure, that'd be really flexible, but it would be pretty hard to work with. So, mm -hmm. you know, particularly if the kids are at one end and the mm -hmm. adults are, you know, trying to have a quiet, <laughs> you know, kind of conversation at the other end, it doesn't work. So you have to, you do have to build things in and you just try to make it in such a way that, um, you know, when things change and I say, well, that it's, it's relatively easy to do, but, 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 you know, bringing character into it is really important, I think. And so, um, you do want to make things spaces elegant and attractive and fun and warm and welcoming and all those kind of things. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, some really good kind of tips in there. I guess one thing I want to ask you on, we run into this a lot and we get asked this question on in regards to power. Everybody needs access to power. Power, you know, it's been a challenge because I think 15 years ago, I don't think it was really hard to imagine how much power we would need. You know, I don't, I think it was really hard for someone to predict how many devices you have. No, we know now, I guess, looking forward, what do you recommend, on, you know, for thinking about, hey, flexibility, evolving, changing? Do you have recommendations how people maybe should be considering about if they're going to do a renovation, they're going to do a build, like to manage power, knowing that they may have to move power or add or whatever that may be? It's a tricky one. I mean, it used to be power and data, and now with mm -hmm. wireless data, we, we we at least you know took half of that problem off mm -hmm. the table, which <laughs> made our lives a lot simpler because data was harder to fit in anyway. Yeah. Um, so wireless has been a great help. 
Um, but power is still there. And um, what we do, we tend to do is we tend to design in a flexible system that can be added to um, later. Now, you know, in the walls, it's relatively easy to sort of maneuver power around. You can take it out and put it in. Uh, floors is where it gets tricky, yeah. Um, particularly if, if you have a concrete slab. And, you know, you're balancing things like, you know, energy, energy efficiency and, uh, and, and power needs. And we find this a lot where we, you know, some of our most energy efficient buildings use a radiant, you know, slab system. So um, that means we have to calculate and install all the power in that radiant slab system, working around all the, all, you know, all of the mechanical issues um, to put in a kind of a grid or an arrangement of power that um, serves the current needs and, you know, is without any real modification will serve us well into the future. But to add to that, you know, can be really expensive. There are systems, there are floor systems, like, you know, like a kind of a duct systems in the floor that you can put in, they tend to be pretty expensive um, and don't always give you that much flexibility. Um, so, so we're often sort of balancing whether we, you know, whether we really should afford to put in, you know, a duct system that, you know, would allow you to put in power outlets every five feet in any direction because, you know, you're spending a lot of money up front that you might never really need. Um, there are also raised floor systems, um, whether the short or the tall raised floor systems, whether you're including mechanical or not. And they're pretty good, too. But again, there's an added cost. And we're always struggling with cost. So, yeah. There is no good answer to this one other than, uh, you know, look at your budget. If you can afford a raised floor system, that gives you the most flexibility that you can, um, hmm. even if it's a shallow one. Um, the other thing for sort of in a pinch, you know, if you, you can't do anything else, we use thin wire in systems, you know, the, the, okay. the, the under carpet um, yeah. wiring. And we've done that in a number of places. And there's some manufacturers that, you know, provide a good thing uh, for that when you just, you can't afford to drill and core and trench your floor slabs, you know, this will be good enough and you can make it work. So, you know, lots of times I tell people like we try to do our best to design the furniture to just get us close to an outlet, get us over something. We'll try to power up the whole system or something like that. But, <clears throat> but even then it's, it doesn't solve all the problems and it's, and it's challenging. We've had a number of people kind of on the podcast here and a lot of people have talked about flexibility. What else are you kind of seeing that's, starting to kind of rise to the surface that you think are kind of new trends for the library market industry? Well, COVID has sort of given us, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, sort of hit us, um, you know, given us a big bump in the road here. But there are some things coming out of it that I think maybe would be beneficial coming forward. You know, one is, um, you know, you know, you know, after sort of all the negative things that it's done, like closing libraries and limiting service and you know, all the shields and barriers, um, we are going to come out of this as a new trend of having um, more sort of space around people. So, you know, probably less packing people in than we used to. So that, yeah. that'll be nice. I think that that sounds good. We're just going to get used to kind of reducing capacity in some ways. Um, and we've already done that with books by lowering our bookshelves, you know, because we don't like tall bookshelves everywhere now. With lower bookshelves, it means, great, we have great sight lines, but we have fewer books. Well, can we live with that? Sure. Of course we can live with that. Better ventilation. Better filtering of the air, more, more, more outside fresh air, better cleaning practices in the building. Those are all good things um, that that will help us in in the past, in in the future going forward. Trends going forward are you know energy efficiency is always a big one. Um, yeah. More and more, you know, we're able to get net zero energy libraries. Um, we've done three of them so far, and oh, wow. um, and it's uh, it's a challenge, but <clears throat> it can be done. And I think you know everybody should be thinking along those lines as we move forward of really sort of going for the big goals. Don't, don't sort of undershoot your, the possibilities of what you actually can achieve. It's not that it's not impossible and it's not, it doesn't break the bank, um, but it does require, it does require an, an investment um, and a deliberate investment uh, by the, by the clients. We always, I don't know if it's a trend, but we always want to sort of, you know, make spaces feel special. Yeah. These aren't warehouses. These aren't, generic spaces. Um, they're not you know, commercial spaces. They're public spaces and they need to feel like public spaces. And by that, I mean um, spaces that people feel belongs to them. Um, that is, you know, was made for them as a member of the community and invested their tax dollars into something that it welcomes them, makes them feel at home, 
uh, and provides them with something that they're not getting anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And um, that to me is sort of personalizing and giving these spaces character and um, a place that people feel uplifted and Mm -hmm. joyous to be in because everybody you talk to has a library story. Everybody has this really strong emotional connection Mm -hmm. to the library at some point in their life. And Mm -hmm. mostly it's the younger, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, younger when they're younger. And um, I just love to build upon that and say, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, the people who are designing for have these memories, Mm -hmm. the people we're designing for are youngsters that will have the memories in the future. And um, so we're trying to create that uh, sense of the library as being this really special place for people. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So if you say it feels like it belongs to them. So how do you, how do you start that process of making it feel like, feels like it belongs to them? Cause that seems very powerful and engaging and impactful, especially in a library space. Well, we start by listening really carefully mm-hmm. and having a process where we are getting out into the community mm-hmm. and we are mm-hmm. hearing from people about themselves and their lives what they need in their lives. It's an extended long conversation when it's done right. Um, I think people um, don't always want to spend the time. You know, they think they know the answers. They want to move forward quickly in a process. They want to be efficient about the time spent. They want to see results quickly. But I think the best results happen as takes it takes as long as it takes to have to get a good result. And we are deeply committed to community involvement processes in our libraries where we, you know, take a really good amount of time to, you know, have a process that involves people in the community and really listens to them. Doesn't tell them what a library doesn't, we don't go in and say, this is what the library is going to do for you. We want to say, what do you need the library to do for you? And then we come back and we synthesize that and we come back and say, well, how about this? Does this look like this is, you know, responding to your, you know, what you, it is that you asked for. And I think if we think, you know, when we do that well, we end up with um, libraries that have the sort of the spaces and the, and the functions within them um, that are relevant to that community. And every community is different. There's no, there are no cookie cutter libraries. That's, I mean, that's what's so wonderful about them, that everyone responds differently. We're, you know, just embarking, you know, one of our new projects now is, you know, from Multnomah County, a couple of branch libraries up there in disadvantaged communities, communities that mm. have a deep, long history of you know, discrimination, some really bad stuff that's happened over years. And we're taking a lot of time. And, and you know, the client is totally behind us um, on this one, leading on this one in terms of having a very thoroughly involved uh, process of outreach and trying to find kind of, you know, how can the libraries help to rebalance some of the inequities that have happened over, over time? Yeah, it sounds like an interesting project. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, <laughs> and I, I always like to do this. So I usually ask people, what, what would you say your favorite project has been so far? Ah. <laughs> oh, who's my favorite child? You know, yeah, I know it's hard. Whoever it's I hard. choose is going to be <laughs> all great. Whoever I don't choose is going to be insulted. I, I, um, but anyway, well, there are a couple of recent, um, libraries that, um, I find have been particularly successful. Um, and it's always kind of the most recent ones that kind of rise to the top. And, <laughs> but our, our Half Moon Bay Library in uh, San Mateo County, uh, south of San Francisco on the coast, is a really good example of a library where we, we had a community process in a fractious community. The community was kind of uh, at war with itself, with each other, factions in the community. They were using the library as a, you know, as, one, as a political issue. They love, everybody loved the library, but they were fighting over it and trying to restrict, you know, what might happen. And so we had a really involved process of bringing everybody together. You know, we spent three or four months um, with these intense community meetings of sort of bringing, making people sit down together and talk about what it is we wanted. In the end, we had unanimous um, consent from, you know, the divided council and people in the community, and and they went forward, and, and all the people that were fighting the library at the beginning, at the end, in the end, were you know basically saying, "Look, I helped create this thing," and they were so mm. proud of it. Um, I mean, the fact that it also turned into like a really beautiful building that fit a community, you mm-hmm. know, in in a very it was an odd kind of laid back beach community, and they wanted something that would really fit in, but nobody knew what that was, and we ended mm-hmm. up with. 
um, that, you know, one planning commissioner said, well, this doesn't look like anything else in Half Moon Bay, but it really fits. And to <gasps> me, that was like, that's the highest praise I could think yeah. of, um, which was that we created something really original mm. that, that suited them. So the right scale, the right materials, the right feeling for them. Great. Uh, and so I'd say that was a really big success. You know, another library is our Hayward Library in, in Hayward, California, a big central city library. Um, it is an amazing offering to citizens, uh, really ambitious from sustainability, uh, um, and but also from kind of the services that it's providing. It is providing such a wide range of services to people in that community that, you know, and it's all sort of down to sort of this really creative energy and leadership of the former director, uh, Sean Reinhardt, and, and the former city manager, Fran David, who together, they sort of came up with some really great, ambitious goals for this thing. And, you know, it is, it's turned into kind of like a flagship library that it is, a, is a sort of a demonstration project. Nice. Interesting. They both sound like great projects. They, they, they really are. They really are. <laughs> So what would you say your most challenging project has been? Oh, they're all challenging. <laughs> I'm sure they all have their moments <laughs> at some point. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, you know, I think challenge always, and I can't think of anyone in particular because I've always had this thing. The biggest challenge is kind of getting as much out of the budget as we can. Nobody has enough money. Nobody ever has enough money. Um, everybody wants a whole lot of, um, a whole lot for not very much. And, um, and so I think, you know, it's, that has been, you know, a real, always balancing the budget has been one of our biggest challenges, but, mm. you know, we've done, we've done pretty well because we've gotten ways of talking about it that allow mm -hmm. people to, um, kind of make choices, you know, so that they are presented with real choices and they can make, you know, use their, use their values to sort of choose, you know, the things that they value the most and, and, you know, get those into the library. Um, from a design perspective, we worked on a number of Carnegie libraries. Okay. And we love mm -hmm. we love Carnegie libraries. Um, we love them from their historical kind of character, uh, and you know just sort of the general history that they've been around for a long time, and they become beloved by the community. But they are a bear to convert into a modern library. And um, you know we have done a couple of them in Oakland, and 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 in uh, and, uh, and a few other places where you know we have really kind of tried to you know make them really work. And we're working on one right now. Mm -hmm. uh, in San Rafael, trying to see if we can come up with a good solution for it. Is that just so, because they're an older building and it just requires more to kind of update it, you know, maybe is the easiest way to say, or? They, they have lots of different levels inside of them. So the accessibility requirements are really yeah. challenging. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, um, you know, particularly on the lower levels where they have meeting rooms on the lower levels, and you're trying to get people in and out without destroying the building and filling it full of ramps and elevators and things like that. The reading rooms are generally really nice, but they're sort of antiquated in terms of acoustics and things like that. So, you, you know, you need to kind of make that work. And they've almost all been um, kind of, remodeled over the years with really kind of non-historical features like, like lighting fixtures or replaced windows and, and sort of casework and things like that. So trying to restore those things back and get the original character back is a real challenge. You know, again, I think, you know, nothing like a good challenge and we love it. So that's right. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't challenging, then wouldn't be engaging. Pretty successful. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. It's interesting as we host these kind of conversations, I'm always interested to hear about problems you're, you're working on now or kind of tidbits you think you want to share with people. I know we went over a lot of stuff, power, flexibility. Um, I think it was great. You know, I love kind of the community approach. It really, I think, gives a sense of kind of ownership of the space. You know, I think involving the community seems like it does two angles for you. One, you're getting kind of the input and feedback you need. But I think then on the flip side, it feels like, hey, this was, I was, like you said, I'm part of this now. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, as, as we kind of, as we're starting to wind down here, what would you say there'd be kind of a problem or kind of a tidbit you'd want to share with somebody? Um, I think, listen, listen to your clients. Mm -hmm. Think broadly about the future. Don't Keep providing the library services as you've been doing, you know, get out there, push the envelope, you know, get uncomfortable, you know, get out of your comfort zone and sort of really start thinking about and exploring hard issues. And, you know, there are plenty of hard issues out there about, 
you know, community and what the community wants and how to relate to the community and the kind of services that you're providing, wondering whether you're sort of, are these the right ones or the not runs? Don't, you know, and sort of maybe, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but don't be afraid to make some mistakes. Um, mm-hmm. Because um, I think that, you know, you can't really advance the cause of what you're providing in service without taking some risks. And, and I think librarians, um, sort of are risk averse in general, mm, I found mm-hmm. not, not all of them, not a mm-hmm. lot of them, but, but a lot, you know, it sort of is sort of trend that people sort of tend to kind of want to just be very safe about what they're doing. And I think, mm-hmm. um, I don't think that serves the community as well, sort of taking a few risks and trying something out that might fail, you know, provide, you know, a program, you know, that uh, maybe is, you know, controversial, or maybe, maybe it's going to be a waste of money, maybe not. Um, but, you know, give it a, give it a try and see what happens. Because I think, you know, the creativity that is inherent in librarians, you know, sort of brains and in their makeup, you know, as they approach what it is that they're doing, it's enormous amount of creativity that I see there and, mm-hmm. and, and sort of energy and commitment to doing something. Um, so it's, for me, it's really about, you know, get outside your comfort zone and provide something unusual and interesting and people are going to love it. Yeah. You know, I think people are looking for that from librarians, you know, and, and they, they have a lot of needs and they have a lot of ideas. <laughs> Listen to those ideas. Cause some of those ideas are great. We do this in design all the time. You know, it's mm-hmm. like we, we have a collaborative design process and we're really honest about that, about saying, you know, great ideas come from everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you got a great idea, I'm going to incorporate that, you know, because I don't think that I've got all the best ideas from a design mm-hmm. point of view. Mm-hmm. And I think from a librarian mm-hmm. point of view, you know, if I think the librarians, you know, will hear things from the community and that might give them ideas about how they could do something. Let those people in the community do a little bit of leading in terms of how these mm-hmm. things are planned. Yeah, no, I think that that's tremendous advice. You know, I really appreciate the time today and especially all the specifics you kind of gave people to kind of help them out and what they should be thinking about as they're going forward. Um, I really want to thank you for your time. You're very welcome. It's been a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm.